should I stumble on? Still I'm caught in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine in all else's space, never ending. Your glory goes beyond your way.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness. Peace out.
Good morning, Rush Church. I hope uh, everyone is doing well. <clears throat> it is May the 3rd. We've been at this, I think, for about six weeks now, or at least I think it's been about six weeks. And uh, certainly looking forward to seeing you, looking forward to meeting together. Uh, I... Uh, the entire you know church, the entire community, the entire you know really whatever you're involved in has gone through a lot of changes lately, and sometimes that can uh, that can be difficult to take. You know, human beings sometimes we're pretty resistant to change. Uh, however, uh, there are some things that do not change. One of those is the love that God has for. His people, his creation, his children. And the other is that Jesus has died and uh, was resurrected. And we are saved by the forgiveness of Christ. Those things don't change. Uh, the whole world may seem different. But those things will never change. And so I, I, I take comfort in that. A um, couple of things before we begin. <clears throat> Don't forget that financial peace uh, begins May 6th. This is going to be online. And honestly, probably the best thing to do or the easiest thing to do if you have any questions about that is just call the office and uh, we'll be able to walk you through uh, anything that you need to do or any contacts that you need to make if you want to participate in financial peace. You still have time. Today's the third, and financial peace starts on the sixth. Ashley and I have done this, uh, and we've used parts of it in our life, and it is, it, it is very beneficial. In fact, over the last few weeks, we have seen, uh, especially, how it's very beneficial in our lives. And so, <clears throat> if this is something that you're thinking about, uh, I encourage you to do it. It, it is, uh, it's a, it's a get out of jail plan, really. It, you know, to, to stop being a prisoner, uh, and to uh, sort of take back control of the things that we need to be good stewards of anyway. Uh, so, if you are curious about that, most of you are already uh, in contact with John in some way, John Young. Um, but if you want more information about that, please just call the office. Also, we are still planning on having Promotion Sunday on May 31st. I don't know who all is going to be here. I don't know who all can be here. Uh, but right now, that's still the plan when kids move from one class up to the next. Uh, and so I invite you to join us for that. Uh, Laura's continuing to plan for that, continuing to plan for things like Vacation Bible School. And again, everything is so uh, up in the air uh, with many things. It's kind of hard to plan. But that's, uh, that's what we're working on right now. Rush Run has been moved to October 24th. Now, the, the yard sale or the garage sale, that's, that's, been, that's been canceled, and, and it may be done later on in the year. Uh, that was scheduled for May 9th. The, the Rush Run, though, is going to be rescheduled for October 24th, which was honestly something they were kicking around anyway uh, before all of this stuff happened. And I think it will be a lot of fun uh, for those who are running. Uh, so it might even be fun for those who are watching. haven't decided yet if I'm going to run or not. might run down to the end of the lane. We are planning, as most of you have heard or probably many of you have heard, we are planning on meeting May 10th. Resume meeting May 10th. This is Mother's Day. It's a week from today. And uh, I will continue, for those of you who are curious, I will continue to put, or we will continue to put, services online, just like we're doing right here. Uh, so you will be able to worship with uh, everyone, you know, here at the church. Uh, we will be doing our live Facebook uh, events. And most of that stuff is going to be done uh, I, the way it's laid out right now during the first service. 
and so that first service may look a little bit different, uh, but I know you, you'll, you'll adapt to that and adjust to that. And then as we go forward, we'll be able to uh, get the programs we need, the technology we need uh, to make that a little bit less intrusive. Uh, but right now, we're planning on meeting on May 10th. I'm very excited about that. Uh, we do it with caution, uh, and we do it with a great deal of planning. At some point, you, you need to make the plan, and you just need to follow through with it. A lot of the information we get comes extremely late uh, in order to plan uh, for the future. Uh, so the elders put together a plan to meet on May 10th. And I encourage you very strongly, please do this, to go to RushChurch.com on the main page. In fact, you may be watching this video on RushChurch.com. On the main page, you don't have to look for it. On the main page, there is a plan uh, for us to begin in-person services. <clears throat> it would take a long time for me to go over the whole thing right now. Uh, but you'll have a chance, you, you have the chance right now to go ahead and read through that. There's 12 different sections. That's not by design, that's just the way it came out. Uh, and I encourage you to read through all of those things. Also, right before you get there on the main page, there's a survey. A survey of which uh, a worship time, which service time you would prefer. Gives us a better idea of seating, gives us a better idea of sanitation in between services, uh, preparation, all these things. But the other thing it does is... It's an attempt uh, to help us even out services. Uh, we're going to go from two services to three services. First service is going to be from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning. The second service is going to be from 9.30 to 10.30. That's your regular first service. And then your, uh, uh, the last service is going to be from 11 to 12, and that's your, your regular second service. Um, so I would encourage you to look at this survey. You'll find a graph on there, a bar graph, three different bars. And what we're trying to do is even out those bars. So if you look at a service and uh, it has fewer people planning on coming than the rest of the services, well, that might be the service you want to pick, if at all possible, so we can even those things out. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not absolutely you know, accurate down to the individual person. But we're doing the very best that we can <clears throat> to begin to meet once again. We're going to have a team that uh, sanitizes in between services. Our seating is going to look a little bit different. Uh, what we do in the church is going to look different. We're going to suspend children's ministry uh, for a few weeks or for as long as we need to. Uh, <clears throat> even entrance and exit to the building is going to be different. That's going to be manned by one specific person. All the doors that we use are going to be open except for the bathroom doors and the doors immediately leading to the outside. But again, those doors are going to be manned so that we don't need to be uh, uh, using the doorknobs and so forth. Uh, the uh, communion is going to look a little bit different. Um, offering is going to look a little bit different. Seating, you'll notice when you get here, is going to look different. All of this because... We want to do the very best we can to get back to a sense of familiarity. But also, we begin now in a slow process to get back to what we like, <clears throat> what is most effective. And it sort of introduces us uh, easily, I think, into some of these, uh, these new ways of worshiping that I don't think are going to last forever. Certainly don't think that, but they are this way right now. There's a lot of other stuff, so I, please go to RushChurch.com, main page, about halfway down, maybe three-quarters of the way down. It's after the survey. Read through all of that. If you have any questions about it, and look, I get it. There's going to be people who love it, people who hate it, and people who don't care, all right? That's life. Um, read through that. If you have any questions about it, please uh, call me. Call me. You can get my uh, personal number from the church directory. You can also call uh, the church office, and you can talk to me about that, okay? I want to get into our message here today as we look at this new hope that we have after a new beginning 
in Jesus Christ. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we have the chance to meet, uh, even though it's at a distance once again. We thank you that you continue to love us and protect us and provide for us. Thank you, Father, that uh, Jesus did die for us and saved us of our sins. We thank you, Father, that that never changes, that you never change, your character, who you are and what you are. We thank you, Father, that everything we do because of Jesus has a meaning behind it. As a, we, have, we have tremendous value and we have a purpose for our lives. And we thank you for that. Father, we ask that you be a part of this service here today. Uh, part of the homes. Part of the living rooms or the kitchen tables or the offices. Wherever people may be listening to this. We thank you, Father, that we can have hope, trust, in who you are and what you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you will, to... 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we are going to look, let me get rid of this here, we're going to look at what this new beginning looks like. And we're going to get a taste of it, we're going to get a glimpse of it. Peter talks about this, but what we're also going to see is, is really two apostles in two different letters going to two different uh, audiences, talking about the same thing, this living hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the hardship that comes along with it. Again, when we look at the resurrection of Christ, we realize that dark days don't last forever, and dark days don't have to last forever, certainly in our lives, if we give our life over to Jesus. There were some things about the revelation of Christ that we don't want to miss, and we find these in the Word of God. And finally, it was time to begin new. And, and again, over the past few weeks, this might be a chance for you to begin new. It might be a time that you have come to understand the importance of accepting Jesus. It might also be a, a rekindling of a relationship that you have had with Christ for many years. No matter how you look at it, it can be a chance for a new beginning. And with this new beginning comes incredible hope, comes a living hope. And there comes proper responses that we have to it. Also gifts as we look, I said gifts, gifts as we look at some of the hardship and struggles and trials that we face in our lives. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We'll get into the rest of that here in just a minute. I find it interesting that God the Father is referred to as the God of God the Son. In fact, there's, late, there's earlier parts in scriptures where uh, uh, where God refers to the Son through a messianic psalm, or multiple messianic psalms, as my Lord. It, it, it shows this incredible relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is no ranking. There is no hierarchy. There are different things that, that, that the persons of the Godhead do, uh, and, and it's mutual submission and love for each other. It's really quite incredible the way they refer to one another. Uh, but here we have this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, praise. This is a reasonable response to the new life that we gain through Jesus Christ. It's a reasonable response to the new beginning that we have through Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ or with Jesus as we are rekindling this relationship. Praise is a reminder. Praise is a reminder that sets our priorities. Praise and worship gives us a proper outlook on life. It gives us a proper outlook on the greatness of God. 
how wonderful he is, how loving he is, as well as the value that we have as we worship the God who created the heavens. And he wants to save you and I. He wants to live eternally with us. That's an incredible value that's placed upon all of those who would give their life to Jesus. It's an incredible value that's placed on all of creation. You see, praise and worship brings us I think, out of despair very often and into gratitude. I, I've thought about this often when we, when we, when we have this, this difficulty, or this struggle with despair in our lives, anxiety and worry and frustration in our lives. It may not be that we have a weakness in our scriptural study. It may not be that there's a weakness in our prayer time. It may be that there's a weakness in our praise time, in our worship time, in our expression of gratitude. All of these things are not only uh, glorifying to God, to Jesus the Christ, but also edifying for you and I. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth, Remember, we talked about a new beginning last week. He has given us a new birth into a living hope. When we partake of this new beginning, we are brought into, we are born anew into God's family, his eternal family. Kind of goes back to that resetting that we talked about last week. And sometimes people desire that. They crave that. If I could just morally. If I could just have a moment. Where I could go back to zero. And start again. <clears throat> we don't let go. Of some of the sins and the baggage. That we take through life. Even after this new beginning. This is a new birth. A new birth. The old has gone, the new is born into God's eternal family. And not only that, we are being renewed. The Spirit renews the believer day by day. Think about that. It's not as though we accept and have this new beginning or this new birth in Jesus Christ and then pick up a bunch of garbage along the way afterwards. No, we are being renewed day by day by the Spirit of God. If we believe it. If we believe it. If we don't believe it, then this new beginning or, or acknowledging a rebirth without this belief, without this trust, is only so many words. It's not a new birth. It's not a new life. It's an attempt at an insurance policy. But if we believe this, that is trust this, that Jesus is God, died for our sins, resurrected to prove he is God and has the ability to conquer death, if that's what we believe, then we are born anew in the God's family. It's talked about throughout Scripture. John 3, 3 through 8 says this. Jesus replied, as he's talking to Nicodemus, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Paul talks about this very same thing. And Peter and Paul, we're going to kind of go back and forth between the two of them today in 1 Peter and in Romans. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Children of God. What does Peter write? That we are born anew 
into this living hope. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8 verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves, that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, that is by the spirit we cry, Abba, Father. That is the closeness to the Father that Jesus, God the Son, had. Understand the implications of of, of Paul's words here. The Spirit draws us into this relationship or potential relationship, if we would allow it, of being as close to the Father as the Son. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so, verse 3 again of 1 Peter, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So why is this done? Not how. We'll get to the how. Why is this done? Because of the mercy of God. Mercy of God. Mercy is a little bit difficult sometimes to define when you try to compare it, I guess, to grace. But uh, I look at mercy as forgiveness and compassion rolled into one. Both of those things, or all three of those things, mercy, forgiveness, compassion, they're all a part of this incredible love under that umbrella of love that God has for his children. And we shouldn't be surprised by this. If we know that there is a God if we know that he created us as his creation, as his children, we should not be surprised at his love for his children. We also shouldn't be surprised at his willingness to let his children make decisions, to live out life. And as it so often happens, children make poor choices. Sometimes children make great choices. Again, none of this should surprise us that it is through the mercy of God that we are given this new birth into a living hope. This new birth, this new beginning is realized and accepted. It is not earned. You have to remember that when we're talking about the mercy of God. Why does this happen? Because of the mercy of God. It doesn't happen because of what we do. It doesn't happen because of how we live. It doesn't happen because of uh, of what we accomplish or, or, or our wealth or our poverty or how many children we have or who we're married to. This living hope is a gift because of the mercy of God. It cannot be earned from the very beginning. And, and maybe this is the first time you've heard this message. If, if, if you're just watching this for the first time here at Rush Church. But something you need to understand from the very beginning, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, I think. At no point in between is there this, this even hint of an idea that we earn our salvation. That's a human construct. We accept salvation because of the mercy of God through, we're going to see here in a second, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because it's a gift, it cannot be taken away from us by any force on this earth and will not be taken away from us by God the Father as he fulfills his promises. It cannot be redefined. It cannot be bought save for Jesus himself. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He bought, because he's God and man, bought our reconciliation, the children's reconciliation, back to the Father. He bought that. He purchased that. It's already bought. You can't pay for it again. You can't pay for it again with with your actions. Actions are not the cause of salvation. 
actions or fruits are the result of giving your life to Christ. It is a living hope that cannot be taken away. This living hope is the certainty of eternal life. That's what Paul, <coughs> excuse me, Peter's talking about here. It is the certainty of eternal life and glory through Jesus Christ. So why is it done? The mercy of God. How was it done? Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Secured by the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Guaranteed by the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. A living hope of eternal life. And if, if we don't understand this, we need to learn. If we don't understand this part of it, this living hope, then we don't understand the gospel. And to recognize that, I think, is a good thing. To recognize that, look, I don't, I don't totally grasp this at this point as I read through 1 Peter. Don't, don't just rely on my feeble explanation. Read through. I don't fully understand how this can be a tremendous gift through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to dive into more deeply the gospel message. But this mercy through the death and resurrection of Jesus brings us new birth into a living hope. But even beyond that, it brings us into an incredible eternal inheritance that we share with Jesus Christ. It is forever secure, no matter what happens on this earth. And right now, secure on this earth is hard to come by. But this inheritance is secured forever. <clears throat> Continuing on, 1 Peter verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. I'll just go back one sentence. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, and I'm going to stop right there. Our new beginning, this living hope, this new birth, leads us to an incredible destination. It is a destination that you have not experienced. You've but had a taste. You've but seen the shadow. It is secured and it is waiting for you and I for all eternity. And by the way, it's not an inheritance as cheap as, uh, you know, jewels or as cheap as, as money or stuff. Um, it's not even a, 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 an inheritance as cheap as, um, you know, lands or titles or, or, or reputations. It, it's much bigger than that. It goes far beyond those things. This inheritance, listen closely now. It is an inheritance of complete perfection through Jesus. I don't even know what that looks like. My mind's not capable of, 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 of seeing that. I have seen a person, fully man, flesh, and blood, that is perfect. I see that in Scripture. I see parts and pieces of his character. But to fully experience it in and of myself, I don't even know what that's like. I, I, I wouldn't even really be able to describe it. We are getting there. We're in that process of being perfected if you have accepted Christ and have the indwelling of God himself, the Spirit, living in this temple. That's called sanctification. But we're not there yet, are we? This inheritance is the realization. It's, it's the completion. It's, the, it's the, the full understanding of this perfection through Jesus Christ pretty incredible inheritance. Not only is our inheritance that, but it is complete fellowship with the God of creation. Complete fellowship with the God of creation. Right now, 
we have an intermediary that is Jesus the Christ, that is the Holy Spirit. We have an intercessor, the priest, right? That's what Jesus is, the high priest, the great high priest. But there is going to be a moment, a time, when this incredible inheritance comes to us that we have a complete and total fellowship with God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To be allowed seems strange if you look at my past and my history. To be allowed to walk into his throne room, to talk, to share, to genuinely understand the depth of the care that God has for us. Again, my, my mind's not capable of wrapping, it wrapping itself around that. That inheritance. Right now, we haven't even talked, right, about the, the, the jewels or the stuff or the titles or the, you know, this and that. No, no, no. We, you you got to set the bar higher when we're talking about the incredible her, inheritance of this new birth, of this new living hope. <clears throat> we have complete. So not only is our inheritance those two things, it is complete understanding and practice of love, peace, and joy. And how hard that is to fully live out today. How often it gets interrupted, doesn't it? This is what we're looking for. This is what we're trying to get. Don't let anyone fool you. If you take it back and take it back and take it back, just, just reduce it down to the very just smallest craving of mankind. What do they want? Peace. Complete peace. They go about it to try to satisfy this need and this craving in sometimes horrible ways. But that's, that's the hunt. And this inheritance gives us a full understanding to immerse ourselves completely in what it actually means to love, what it actually means to have peace, what it actually means to have an eternal joy. What else do we gain in this incredible inheritance? A complete knowledge of our worth. Not what the world tells us, not what our imagination tells us, but an absolute correct and wonderful understanding or assessment of ourselves before the creator of the heavens. That's humility, by the way. I think a great definition of humility, a correct assessment of oneself. And I think if we ever get to the point of a correct assessment of ourselves before God, it's going to be something that we bask in. And we have a complete understanding of our wonderful relationship with God and our purpose. What else is a part of this, of this inheritance? Retaining personhood. That's a part of the inheritance. I'm going to know that I'm me. You're going to know that you are you. It's not some, you know, some ridiculous idea that we, we fade off into some mystical, undefinable ether and there we find peace. No, we retain who and what we are. That's what God created. That's what God wants. That's what God wants to live eternally with. He certainly wouldn't have sent his son to die on the cross for you if you were just going to fade into energy. What an incredible inheritance so far. It is a solid, knowable, and I think in many cases a very familiar inheritance, a very familiar knowledge and understanding the inheritance protected for you and I. That's what this living hope is, guys. That's what Peter's talking about. Into this living hope. It's all wrapped up in this eternal life, this salvation by Jesus, this inheritance that we receive. And maybe other things besides. 
what we've mentioned in the inheritance. I just wanted to talk about the really, really cool stuff. Again, going back to Paul, Romans chapter 8. He echoes this same thing as we're talking about being heirs. Listen, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, listen to these words, and co-heirs with Christ. Think about those. Think about that for a second. God has taken this relationship between us and Jesus and allowed us to perceive him not just as God, not just as Lord, not just as Savior, but as family, brother, sister, brother, brother relationship. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That's that inheritance that Peter was talking about. If indeed we share in his sufferings. We'll get there in a second. In order, <coughs> excuse me, that we may also share in his glory. And we read this too quickly sometimes. That we, you and I, those who have this new beginning, those who have this new life, this new hope, that we may also share in giving him glory, which would be perfectly fine and perfectly good and right. But that's not what the word of God says here. The, along with these incredible gifts and this incredible inheritance, what does the word of God say through Paul in Romans 8? In order that we may also share in his glory. That's the living hope. That's the living hope. Continuing on, the last part of verse 4, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Over the past weeks, many that I have seen, I, I, really not so many that I've spoken to, but many that I have seen or heard about have feared losing, losing. Sometimes things very important, health, life, Sometimes things not as important, stuff, property. Sometimes things that are just absolutely, uh, absolutely scary sometimes. Jobs, losing jobs. I suppose maybe even uh, some of those folks who are teaching their kids and putting effort and time and just a bunch of you know, everything into that, being closed up and cooped up, maybe even feared uh, losing their, their sanity for a little bit. The inheritance of glory as a result of this living hope is not one that can be lost. That's what Peter's talking about here. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be left to rot. It cannot be forgotten. Or here's a big one. It cannot be in limited supply. Our true selves, this complete picture that we will once have, or that we will have, is guaranteed an inheritance of glory protected by God himself. It is protected in heaven for us. It is kept in heaven for us. And until it is realized, that is we, you know, the, the, the spirit of those who hang upon this living hope, we are protected or shielded by our faith, that is our trust, our complete trust in God and in his resurrection. We are told to carry, right? We're told to carry this faith, carry this shield of faith. That's what this protection is, this shield it is. Interesting how Peter says we are shielded by faith. In Ephesians 6, Paul says the shield of faith. And the shield extinguishes the arrows that we get shot with, that you've been shot with, perhaps have been shot with lately or at lately. But even faith is empowered 
by God through his mercy. It is powered by God's omniscience, his omnipotence, and his omnipresence. So far, this new beginning, this rebirth into a living hope sounds like a pretty good deal. I like it. I mean, this is something to look forward to. This isn't something to fear. This is something to want, to crave. It's a goal in life. I mean, this is, this is something to look forward to. And I almost wish, I almost wish Peter would stop here. Stop here with, with verse 5 and move on to the rest of the stuff you want to talk about. But he doesn't. He continues on. Verse 6, he says this. I almost wish he would stop. I'm glad he doesn't. I'll tell you why here in a second. Verse 6, he says this. In this you greatly rejoice. That is all of this stuff we've just talked about. We ought to. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In this you greatly rejoice, first of all, which is fitting. It is not temporary happiness, but an eternal peace that is eagerly anticipated with certainty. What if this was it? I mean, look around the world. Look at the struggles and the trials and the hardships and the terrors of the world. What if the bad of this world was all there was? If that's the case, where is the joy? Where's the cause for joy? If that's the case, where is the cause for peace? Where is the cause for, for this eternal and living hope that we can put our faith and our trust in? Shoot, what's the purpose of tomorrow if this is all there is? We rejoice that all of these things are absolutely certain now that we have had a new birth and a new beginning in Jesus Christ. Though for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And I don't need to pretend, you don't need to pretend that you haven't experienced some of these griefs. I know you have. In your own life, in the lives of those you care about and you love, and around the world to the extent that sometimes we can't even fathom. But is that a bad thing? All right, let me rephrase. Is it only a bad thing? I mean, obviously, pain and heartache and you know, death and evil and, and just hatred, all, these, all, these, all of these things are bad, but are they only bad? That's the question I have. Is it only a negative? Do these things happen because God's taking a break, because he doesn't care, because he's, he, he's there to give us our reward but really doesn't care in the meantime? Whoever makes it just happens to make it. Is he going back on his promises? I mean, is this stuff all bad? Look at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Look at what he says. These have come, and we just got done talking about a new birth, a rebirth, a, a new beginning, a living hope. He says, but there's some bad stuff there in your life. He says, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even th though refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed let's Let's look at what Paul says in Romans 8. We're going back and forth here. Romans 8. For the creation was subjected, this is 20 through 21, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You can't read 1 Peter chapter 1 without reading Romans chapter 8. 
we see clearly through both of these accounts that God allows trouble, uses trouble for the testing of faith. For proving the genuineness of our trust, the genuineness of our word, the genuineness of our pursuits. To prove for whom? God? Do you think he doesn't know? Do you think he doesn't know our hearts better than we do? It is so we may know the genuineness of our faith. That's what Peter's getting at here. That's what Paul's getting at here. So that we may be refined and purified. So that we may be strengthened. We are not informing God by going through difficulty, hardship, and trial and how we respond to it. We're informing ourselves. We're teaching ourselves. See, that's, that's what hardship does. It holds up a mirror. And it asks, who are you really? What do you really believe in? See, we, we have a tendency sometimes to look at hardship, struggle, and trial as all bad. But the reality is, some of the struggle we go through can be a tremendous gift. Tremendous gift. To finally begin to have a full understanding and perspective of who we are. It has happened to me few times in life, but it has also happened to me over the past few weeks. And there are trials that I have, again, for me, God's not, God's not saying he doesn't love me, he's not kicking me out, he's not, he's not, none of that stuff. But these trials for me. Some I have passed and some I have failed. But these things are done that they may ultimately result in praise and glory and honor. Don't forget the wording now. Don't forget the wording here. Don't forget the wording in Romans Praise, glory, and honor that the believer will share in. That the believer may praise, glorify, and honor Jesus Christ as surely as I'm standing here, I give you my word, that would be enough. But it goes beyond that in his indescribable gifts. These things happen that we might Share in that, that praise, glory, and honor of Christ when he is revealed. This is storing up treasures in heaven. Jesus talks about that during his ministry. This is the kind of stuff he's talking about. Storing up this living hope. Relying upon, pursuing this living hope. This certainty in Jesus Christ. Again, with our mind on 1 Peter 1, 7, talking about uh, the difficulty and hardship, 1 Peter uh, 1, 6, all of this. Look at Romans uh, 8, 18 and 19. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory of that be, will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God.
to be revealed. That's what this does. That's what this does. That's what this refinement does. It reveals the children of God. This is the realization, the completion of the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But it's not the full experience that we have in the hope of Christ. That begins now. The full experience begins today. The full experience begins at that new beginning. That you realize, and that you realize as sure as the sun's going to come up, you realize as sure as you're standing in one place, that this heaven and this earth will pass away, but I won't pass away because of who and what Jesus is. I get to share in these things. And don't think for a second that I'm standing here saying I'm the one that deserves to share in these things. It's because I realize I don't deserve to share in these things that I know it's going to happen. Because my life is protected by Jesus. I need Jesus because I know my life. I need Jesus because I know my thoughts. I know my struggles. I know where I fail these trials and tests. And so I give my life to Christ. So that even me and all of my struggle and hardship and screwing stuff up, I still have a living hope every day. And I'm being renewed. We don't see everything yet. Verse 8 of 1 Peter 1. Though you have seen him, you, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Again, Paul echoes that 8:22 and 25, or through 25. This might not be on your on your slides. <clears throat> we know that the whole creation has been growing, groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right? At present time not only so but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies for in this hope we are saved but hope that is seen is no hope at all who hopes for what they already have but if we hope for what we do not yet have we wait for it patiently and what are we gaining what are we receiving what is the end result of this new beginning this rebirth this adoption into the family and the new hope, the living hope. Verse 9 of 1 Peter 1, you are receiving the end result of your, your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's the point, right? If Jesus would have failed to conquer death for us, we wouldn't be worshiping him now. But he conquered death for you and I, witnessed by, by numerous people, recorded, along with miracles that happen, being revealed to us even today, to our minds, our hearts, being revealed through the word of God, being revealed through the church. This is the living hope. When all else fails and all else fades and all else can be taken away, as many have seen over the past few weeks, this living hope protected, protected in heaven for you and I. Next week when we meet, um, we're going to get we're going to get a little deeper actually into the gospel message. I've been looking forward to this series for about two years now. I'm going to fit it in uh, here when we start meeting again. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the book of John, or, or the letter of 1 John, rather. And we're going to see the gospel message laid out, played out for you and I. It will be recorded, and we will do it, we will do it here. And so... If we still need to understand a little bit more about this living hope, I encourage you to be a part of that. I encourage you also to rekindle your relationship with Christ. I'm not talking about resave yourself. If you've given your life to Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior, you don't have to re-up you know, re that every year. You don't have to do that. 
But maybe rekindle a close, personal relationship with Christ. If you haven't accepted this truth, now's the time. Now's the time. You can, in this next week, you can call me. You can be here. We can talk. We can study. I encourage you to do those things. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Anyone who, who can be here. Anybody who feels comfortable being here. If you feel comfortable being here, that's good. If you don't feel comfortable being here, that's good. There's no right and no wrong answer here. But I look forward to seeing you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this worship time. We thank you for this incredible gift, this, this living hope that is a part of each of our lives. We thank you that it comes not only with salvation, but an amazing inheritance. Again, Father, that I, I, can't, I can't even fully picture. I, I don't even know how to feel about it as we talk. Yet I know it's true. I thank you, Father, for your love. I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your care for this place and this church, these people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next week. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.